good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our first uh, Zoom panel on uh, collecting Seiko. And I'm um, happy and delighted to welcome our three panelists for today. Uh, I'm going to quickly introduce you. Uh, most of them are, uh, most of you must be familiar with the three panelists, but for those who don't, uh, just a quick introduction, uh, starting with Osman, uh, Ozzy. Ozzy is not on Instagram anymore, but he used to have this popular account called Vintage Watch Dubai. And he's, he's basically a vintage uh, watch guy, but has an, an unending love for Seiko. Uh, thank you for joining us, Ozzy. Thank you, Nitin. Uh, that, that's, that, that's correct. Uh, like most people, most people this week, who've left uh, WhatsApp and Facebook, moving to single, uh, Signal and Telegraph, who knows? Uh, Signal and Telegraph could be the new Instagram, who knows? But uh, as you'd mentioned, I kind of began my love for Seiko uh, back a long time ago. It was the three M's. It was uh, uh, military, uh, motorsport, and, uh, and movies. And uh, these are kind of like the three pillars we'll find Seiko all throughout. And ever since then, Seiko kind of gave me and I think uh, Faisal and Stefan will say it's, it just gave us great accessibility to start our collections. And I think one of the things around it was just allow us to have a lot of fun and uh, experiment with a lot of different watches and stuff as well. So thanks for having me tonight. All right, thanks, Ozzy. Uh, next up, uh, I'm going to introduce you to Faisal. If, if you've been on Instagram over the last two years, chances are you've run into Faisal. He's uh, a prolific presence on the Instagram. He's a great collector. He's got a very really nuanced uh, taste in, in uh, when it comes to watches. And again, I'm happy to introduce him today. Welcome, Faisal. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you can hear me clearly, but uh, um, this um Facebook is a huge huge world right and uh, you know going after somebody like Osman or even Stefan I feel uh, you know that I barely have scratched the surface of Seiko uh, my love affair with Seiko started in duty freeze out of all out of all places right so it would be when I'm traveling and I wanted something small to pick fun to keep me company during my trip and after I get those initial pieces, I do the research and what Seiko is today with all in the Brassage and the Grand Seiko and Credor and everything else around the brand just lets you know how amazing and how big this is. Now, thank you for the amazing introduction. I'm not, you know, prophetic. I, 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 <laughs> this is something that I love uh, to do. And, you know, being here today with, with everybody else is just, uh, you know, very, very humbling for me. So thank you. I Thanks, Faisal. And of course, uh, Stefan, who uh, you better know as Rist in Time on Instagram. Stefan has uh, lived and worked in Tokyo, so uh, Seiko and Grand Seiko are brands that are very close to his heart. Again, uh, a collector with an immense love for both these brands, but, but apart from Grand Seiko and Seiko, Stefan is, is, Stefan's collection is something you need to sort of, if you haven't followed him on Instagram, please do his, his his taste in watches is something I admire a lot. So thanks a lot, Stefan, for coming tonight. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here tonight, uh, Nitin, and, uh, and thank you, uh, everybody. And it's nice to be amongst this company, right, uh, Faisal? Uh, absolutely. You, you would say that you're not prolific on Instagram, but your stories are something to behold. So I absolutely. I think you should rename yourself to, to make sure that people know your Instagram. Um, so where did I start with Seiko? I, I have to say that uh, a, a lot of it has to do with the duty-free uh, passing as well, as Faisal was mentioning. Uh, but my father uh, had uh, one of these early um, free SKX. I don't remember exactly which one it was because it broke and uh, it no longer was on his wrist and was very soon replaced by um, a Seamaster later on. And I've kept asking him, you know, asking him, what is it? Which model was it? And he doesn't remember. And we can't tell in pictures. But one of these days, I'm going to post some on Instagram. I'm sure some people can actually help us ID the watch that actually started my love for Seiko. Um, and I think we'll talk more about it. But once you once you start touching into that brand, uh, it it just sucks you in. It's a beautiful brand. Thank you. Right. So to start off with, I would like to ask you what. What was the first Seiko that you guys bought and what attracted you to the brand? Osman, if I can start with you. 
Yeah, no, no problem. The first one I, I actually ever, ever bought uh, was this. It's uh, 6139. I'm not sure if you can, can you see that okay? Is that, is that yep. doing it justice? Yeah. Yeah. 6139. And that's a 6139 six, 6002. Six, so it's not quite a poke. And uh, interesting, interesting sort of behind it. I wanted to have a automatic chronograph. And uh, as Stefan had uh, rightly pointed out, the thing about Seiko is that they've been around for so long. They've done so many great things for so long. And I think the, the, the 6139 was the world's first automatic chronograph, March 1969. So I said, I want to I get one of these, but um, hard enough to find. If you go into eBay, it's perilous. Um, I used to work in classifieds. Again, it's still perilous to buy a watch from there. So a good buddy of mine, uh, Hisham, took me up to uh, a souk in Sharjah. And uh, it was basically kind of, uh, for want of a better word, a junk shop. And there was lots and lots and lots of uh, buckets of watches. So I managed to go through, got a few of these like uh, po Pogesque watches. Got this one for about, say, 200 dirhams. And then uh, I, what I wanted to do is get it slowly restored. And I sent it off to a very good buddy, a buddy of mine back home called David McCain. Um, bench dweller uh, uh, bench dweller uk who's actually now a very famous seiko restorer in the uk i would consider him like the spencer klein of uh, of seikos in the uk and ironically uh dave is just up the road from where i was born and dave helped restore when i say restore he fixed the he fixed the pusher he fixed a uh, pump pusher on a on a gen one raf so that kind of brought me to this watch that kind of started the whole thing for seiko for me and uh, ever since then um I got more and more into the brand. I was doing a lot of recreational scuba diving and we always use the term of a beater watch, a, week, a weekend beater. And the great thing about um, uh, quartz uh, and the great thing about a Seiko is you can just put it on the weekend, jump into uh, salt water, go off to Fajera, go off in the pool and you can uh, you know, wear, wear it not have to worry about it. And that kind of brought me more and more into Seiko, but this would have been my first official Seiko, which I purchased. And also one of the first watches that I ever restored it's sporting a uh, uncle seiko uh president bracelet and we'll go more i want to talk a little bit more about bracelets as well later on in the show in the show as we call it i know faisal has some thoughts on that and uh we'll talk a little bit more about bracelets i'll talk about the first ever solid link jubilee which was not for rolex and stefan um yeah so i was, I was alluding uh earlier uh, you know my, my father got me into watches to be honest uh, and i always remember uh the seiko that he had on his wrist and this kind of search for that uh predecessor of the skx whether it was a 7002 or not I, I, i'm not too sure at this point of course my father doesn't remember and that's one of the things about uh seiko right a lot of people have owned seikos and they don't even know what watch they have right uh so that actually started me with uh good old skx Right. So this is not how it looked like when I got it. This is now modeled. I, I got the 171 SKX 171. Um, I like the 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 surround uh, around the uh, around the indices um, on the dial. Uh, and then later on, I ended up modding it, which is another thing that's that's great about this uh, Seiko uh, community, particularly the SKXs. So uh, this was stuck when I got it, and I really really regret having modded it. Um, but I did anyway. I mean, I have other watches to fill that spot, but as the first Seiko, uh, and the fact that I actually ended up modding it, it's it's still kind of a testament to how how this brand can become uh, different in the in the hands of their own uh, um, fans, right? So, modern community on its own is a is an entirely different thing. And we can talk bracelets as well, and swapping bracelets, etc., and making the watch your own. Something that with other brands you can first of all, not do. And second of all, almost no other brand is going to be acceptant or the other fans are going to be acceptant of the fact that you're doing that to a watch. Whereas the Seiko community was, is always going to uh, greet this kind of things with open arms. So yeah, that was my first kind of trying to chase that, um, that great whale, if you will, the, my, my father's uh, Seiko. Uh, I'm sure I'll find it at some point, uh, but yeah, SKX. I completely agree about the uh, the modding bit. It's it's a rabbit hole, you know. Once you go down that uh, route, it's uh, I mean, there's so many options and there's so many different ways you can make your Seiko completely your own, you know. And and it's there's such a thriving community as well, people who mod and people who are willing to help you or figure out what to do with your watch. Uh, moving on to Fazel. Look, uh, I'll tell you, it uh, the SKX 007, right? And I can tell you that this is going to be the entry point for so many people until it was discontinued, right? But um, 
like I said, I picked it up, knew very little about it, then started reading about it, and uh, I just fell in love for what it was, right? This diver that, you know, is at a fraction of the cost of much bigger brands, but it, it's, it's a diver at its core, right? The second, the second piece that I really, really fell in love with is the cocktail time, right? And the cocktail time was an impulse pickup. It was when they were launched, you know, with all these um, drinks, uh, you know, bubbly drink uh, nicknames. So the one I picked up was the espresso martini. Until today, and, you know, I mean, you know my collection and you know how diverse it is, you know, not just Seiko's. It's still one of the most handsome watches that I've ever worn right the details on a watch like this for the price point the, the work on the dial regardless whether it's machine made regardless of you know the movement i mean at the end of the day we know the position of this watch and we know the price point right but the details the curved uh, seconds hand the power reserve um there's just so many details on a watch like this so these two watches got me reading and researching Seiko and modern Seiko and Presage. And then once you do this, this is what takes you back in time to realize that Seiko isn't what most people make out of it from a perception perspective, right? Uh, uh, like I said, there's heritage, there's watch making involved. Um, there is as much heritage in mechanical Seikos as there is in quartz Seikos, right? Um, even though people, you know, might position Seiko as this quartz disruptive company that came in to break the Swiss industry, so on and so forth. But never had they stopped going into mechanical. Um, so these two watches for me were very, very important. They might not have as much historical uh, perspective as a military watch or a Pogue or something else that came along. But these are the points of entry today, just like they did with me, that, you know, they would have with new or younger collectors that would go into the brand um, and then once they start reading about it understanding all these layers of what Seiko stands for. Right. B before we go any further let's do a quick uh, wrist check. Fazil what are you wearing today on your wrist? So I don't know if you can see it clearly I'm wearing the Cap Captain Willard uh, reissue the new one that came out and I love so I, there's so many elements about this I like not just about the piece uh, I like the fact that it's not limited. I love this. I think, you know, this is counterintuitive to what a lot of brands did in 2020. This is smaller than the previous three issue. That's again, counter to what a lot of the brands are doing. It wears like a gem, you know, uh, it has this Tuna-esque uh, case. Um, the olive green is very nice because Apocalypse Now was all about, you know, the army and, and, and everything else. So olive green suits it as a color, uh, but that's what I'm wearing today. Right, and Stefan? Let me unmute myself. Um, so I'm wearing my 7549 7000. Uh, this is um, a quartz tuna, right? So for those uh, unfamiliar with the tuna, this is my favorite tuna of all the watches. Initially, uh, this is a watch that initially the shape was, without actually handling it, I was not so into. I thought this kind of round watch was a bit odd, right? And, you know, Seiko has a couple of those odd watches like the Monster and uh, and others, right? And these nicknames, right? So the, this Tuna um, is, is one of my favorites for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one is the first ever quartz professional driver uh, diver, right? So, uh, you know, associating quartz with Seiko, it goes hand in hand. So for me, this is a very special piece. The second thing is it's actually very thin comparable to other tunas. It's supremely wearable. Uh, and it's actually smaller in diameter. I've got small wrists, so, so you know. Um, I love the, uh, you know, the markers are a little bit creamy because it's, uh, it's actually for my birth year, uh, 1981, and they're turning a little bit creamy and uh, yeah, lovely piece. Right, I'm, I'm always been amazed at how wearable that particular tuna is. The, the, the case size is so much easier to wear. Yeah, I mean, you can see here on my, you know, seven and uh, the six forty-five uh, a quarter inch wrist. So it's it's actually really small, quite wearable. Right. And Aussie, what have you got on today? I, I really want I really want Stefan's watch. Just <laughs> 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 like over at Sarah's bleeding strike there, um, and and Stefan actually makes a good point there on the on the nicknames around Seiko. Um, it, it's really hard to imagine any other brand that has so many different nicknames. For the watches from Seiko Alien, 
uh, Faisal said the Willard, uh, you know, you've everything from there, Dracula and everything. So this one doesn't actually have a nickname. This is uh, a 6139 uh, but it had a very yeah. beautiful uh, two color uh, tachometer. And again, it's a 6139, so it's an automatic chronograph. This one's 1972. Um, I deliberately haven't had it restored, just swapped out the glass. And I always keep it on a 19 mil uh, period correct um, tropic as well. And it's nice because you don't really see a lot of 19 mil straps anymore. And uh, as, as Stefan had rightly said, it just wears, you know, the height of the watch is very, very slight, uh, but the technology within the watch as well, you know, the uh, actual, uh, the crown is a, you know, it's a three function, four function actually, in ter terms of a crown back in the seventies, how could you possibly begin to explain that to somebody about all, all the technology that this has? So that's kind of one of my favorite little uh, automatic chronographs there. Right, I'm, I'm wearing a, okay. an SPB 147. This is the 55th anniversary uh, recreation. I've, uh, I think among the watches that were released in the sub 5,000 dirham category last year, I think this is probably my favorite and, and I've worn it pretty much every other day since I've had it. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a nice little uh, case size as well, 40.5 mm, so it works perfectly for me. Uh, moving on, um, this is something that most of us have talked about in the past. Have you, th there's, there's always been some kind of snobbery associated, you know, uh, around collecting Seiko. You know, there have, there have, there have, we've all encountered that in the past. It's, it's, it's not a high-end Swiss mechanical watch, but I mean, how have you sort of dealt with that? But one quick question. Do you mean snobbery yeah. by non-watch sake, by yeah. non yeah. Yeah. collectors? Yeah. Okay. It's by okay. right. Yeah. Yeah, I, so, I have, uh, I have personally, sorry, Stefan, please go ahead. Go ahead. I'll see. I'll go ahead. Thank, thanks, buddy. Yeah, I have personally, uh, about five years ago, uh, from a jet from a gentleman here who only collected extremely high-end uh, Rolexes and he said I just don't like Seiko and this is gentleman in his 50s or 60s so he would have saw Seiko at its finest uh, during, during its heyday and he said I just don't, didn't like the brashness of it I didn't like the fact that they were a, a mall watch and it's a real common misconception that uh, Seiko, Seiko was branded a mall watch you can buy an SKX you know 38 mil for sub $200, but you can also go spend $400,000 on a minute repeater crater and the craftsmanship. So how, how I kind of counter with that, I, I spoke to him about the craftsmanship, I spoke to him about the heritage, and I spoke to him the fact that they literally, as a company, um, Stefan had mentioned about um, um, uh, quartz, like at one stage, Staker were growing their own quartz crystals, they have their own synthetic uh, grease, which no other manufacturer have, and my counter to him was if you can appreciate the Seiko Corporation as, as a watch company, you shouldn't be able to appreciate any watch company. And this elitism that surrounds uh, snobbery, the, the idea behind the wristwatch, that it should, it should be available to, to all at that entry point. And that's why Seiko, when, when, when Seiko collectors come together, it is a very strong community. Like you'll say, you'll say Stefan, where did you get that mod? I'll say to Faisal, tell me about that strap. You know, I used to do a lot of Cerakote on my watches and do a lot of stuff around that. And it's it's so much fun to do. And you have you have a whole wide community, even here in Dubai, of people mo modifying Seikos. So it really, really disappoints me when people have this elitism and, and snobbery towards Seikos. Because from my point of view, and we'll all agree, they're just missing. These are some of the most fun, some of the most beautiful. And from my point of view, some of the best wearing and durable watches I've ever owned, hence the majority of my collection would be based in I think all should say that for it uh, as well. I absolutely agree with you, Rossi. Uh, I've, I've encountered, and I'm sure Faisal will, will echo this, I've encountered that uh, snobbery as well. I think everybody that that's uh, into Seikos in any um, in any depth uh, is going to have encountered that, especially if you meet other watch collectors, right? Could they start comparing with you know other brands? And uh, I, I, I have to say that I personally love that. I I thrive on that. I really enjoy when somebody looks down on on one of my Seikos. Uh, I particularly enjoy it when somebody uh, looks down on a Grand Seiko, right? I know we're talking only about Seikos, but of course the brand uh, expands. And then the 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 catch question: They go, "You spent how much on, on a Seiko?" 
<laughs> I wait for that question. I wait for that question. And then, as you said, Ozzy, you're talking to them about, well, let me tell you a little bit about Seiko, right? And this, uh, not only is the, the Japanese craftsmanship that goes be, behind that, and that's kind of a, a, a given and everybody knows about that, mm -hmm. but also the Japanese ingenuity uh, in actually inventing so many things, right? You know, first, uh, first quartz uh, diver, the quartz itself and how they actually shook the industry upside down. Um, how they can go from a mall watch to that mineral repeater you were talking about, Ozzy. Like, how many companies can do that? It's a fully in-house watch. It has true deep heritage, right? Whether it's a diver, whether it's a chronograph. In fact, the you know who made the first chronograph? That's very much still in the air. First chronograph in space. That's another. That's a bit of a debate, right? I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that. So, uh -huh. so in terms of uh, brand heritage, I mean, I love your comment, Ozzy. You know, if you can't appreciate the Seiko Corporation uh, as a watch brand, you really can't appreciate any other brand. So, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. No. So I I, I very much agree. Um, I think some some great points were mentioned, and I think look, it all starts at home, right? My brother, my brother, who is also a watch collector, when I started getting into Seiko, so I mean, you know, why why are you spending money on Seikos? And and it's it's what Seiko gives me. Very few other brands can give me, right? Um, and I also thrive on these because the second you take your Seiko off and hand it to the person who's who's being a snob mm -hmm. he'll realize I mean that's already the first pose you're going to get specifically if you're not wearing you know a, 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 any Seiko right but I mean I'll give you the I'll give you the example again of my enamel dial presage that I got right the first one that came out um, the, 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 the midnight uh, spring moon you know concept you just hand it to anybody generally enamel dials were only kept for high horology brands. You're talking about, you know, real craftsmen and a single enamel dial maker that would work on, on you know, brands like Patek Philippe and even, you know, beyond. whereas here I had, this is not just, you know, a dial that was thrown in, a, in an oven to cook and put on a watch. So there are, and, you know, based on the Seiko you're wearing at the time, somebody's being a snob, I think it's so easy to, you know, um, have them pose and rethink, you know, what they talk. At the core of divers or any, you know, or, or, or my Samurai Blue Lagoon, for example, right? Speaking of nicknames, uh, Blue Lagoon yeah. and Brook Shields, you know. But if you take a Samurai, it is a tool watch and it's everything a tool watch is supposed to be, right? And I don't want to mention other brands or compare it to bigger brands, but if you're paying 20K, or 30K for a watch that's gonna go 200 or 300 meters down. It's a screw down crown, um, screw case back. I mean, everything that you expect in a diver, ISO certification, so on and so forth, then this two, 3000 dirham watch can do the same thing, right? Um, so again, there are so many reasons for you or, or so many ways to overcome snobbery. One of them, and, and you know, again, you're wearing the 55th anniversary. We're not talking about, you know, 20 years or, or, or 10 years of watchmaking. We're talking about 55, 60, 70, 80 years of watchmaking, a company that is dedicated to, 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 to making watches, whether they're quartz, whether they're mechanical, whether, you know, they're high end, low end, doesn't matter. That's a company at its core that's a watchmaker. So I think the issue of snobbery as well is whether, you know, somebody who buys watches for, for horology, perspective than you know versus just buying a tool watch for what it's supposed to be right so i think we any seiko lover as stefan said would thrive on somebody coming and criticizing you know the decision of of, of rocking a seiko on any given day yeah, yeah. I, I, th I think the fact remains that there are not too many brands who can claim to make their own hair springs and mainsprings and pretty much everything else in-house you know and and yeah. offer it at this kind of price uh, the, the price to performance ratio on Seiko watches have been I mean, unbeatable for a long time. Uh, yeah, no, uh, sorry, if I may just add one thing, you know, somebody, a lot of people will tell you, look, you know, oh, a lot of the SKXs came with misaligned bezels or I don't know what. It's part of the charm, right? Yeah. This is part, for, for us, at least for me, it's part of the charm, right? <laughs> I know what I'm getting myself into and I'm loving it for that. So, so, you know, it is what it is, as they say. Moving on, uh, last year was a big year for, for Seiko. They celebrated uh, the 55th anniversary of their first uh, diver's watch, the 62 mask. They had a bunch of new uh, new releases. 
what did you guys make of of the watches i mean from the villa to the new spb uh, 62 mass recreations i know i know uh, stefan has a, a few strong views on on the new uh, 62 mass uh, recreation sure you want me to start um uh, well uh, there are two two threats to my to my answer to that the first one is um uh, i'm going to start with the negatives and then i'm going to move to the positives the negatives is uh i could summarize in one sentence is way too many limited editions um even though uh we also had our first share and that goes on to the positives of the non limited um what we saw particularly on the 62 mass point uh, reissue uh, side of things we had the 55 anniversary edition you know with the blue blue dial and the um ever ever brilliant uh, steel i think if i recall correctly mm-hmm. um that that the trilogy of watches and then a little bit after that we had another limited edition with a uh, with a uh, collaboration with a japanese clothing store uh, which is basically almost the same as the SLA 017 that was released a few years ago um and then there was one that was kind of also limited but a larger number with the um with the light blue uh, second hand as well so from that perspective i believe that these kind of things have diluted a little bit in terms of you know celebrating the first the first diver or celebrating the willard in the case of the SLA 017 i think what they did with the willard and this goes to the positives is actually spot on So a few years ago they released the SLA 033, right? A little bit more upbeat, uh, up, sorry, more off scale uh, with the Grand Seiko movement inside on decorated Grand Seiko which is, you know, a, a, a hidden secret in the industry. And that was, you know, a, an expensive quote unquote a less more uh, less of a of an entry level uh, purchase, right? And then some people that wanted to buy it they could have bought it and it was limited. Fantastic. A few years later and actually today we have the uh, the Willard uh reissue, the SPV 1 uh, 151 SPV 153. And I think that's the right way of doing that, right? I think that's the right way of giving some time to appreciate and okay, here's a time we're going to celebrate the first or in this case the second, uh, sorry the third. Um and and after that moving to something that is more mainstream with some changes what they did with the SLA with the 62 mass reissue i'm not too happy about so on the positives i think this is a the, this particular watch is a, a is a home run for seiko i have to say i posted i posted this watch yesterday for the first time on instagram it's been less than 24 hours on my instagram and it's the second most liked uh, photo that i've posted in the last two years that oh. that's a testament in and of itself right so uh i was very surprised about that i love the watch it wears really really well i think a lot of wrists are going to be happy with it so i think that that's my positives and negatives of the 55 anniversary right ozzy what what did you make of it um i think i, I definitely agree with everything that Steph, stefan has said there for me it was uh, it was around the brand positioning of the actual brand itself and So sometimes one of one of the things I love about Seiko is one of the things that I just like but the most is they're not very good at marketing and uh, as Stefan rightly mentioned it was uh, fragmented in terms of what they're bringing to market for example the the first edition Willard with uh, Grand Seiko movement uh, ba- basically that's uh, Stefan that's a bit that's a big industry secret but now, now the word is out that was what, a what $4000 watch and then then eventually nobody we were so frustrated by that because we were not going to drop four and a half thousand dollars on a 615 free edition but when, when they come out with something like this it's an absolute home run you can uh, it's accessible it was hard to understand what was going on um there was so much noise so many editions and you're like well look where where is the brand now am i going to go move into grand seiko or am, am i going to wait for like a hybrid marine master g uh, grand seiko pard something else to come out and you just didn't know what was going on what i will say what i like about seiko is they have this almost a uh, childlike approach in how they bring things out for example last year you had all the street fighter editions even more editions after that. then out of the blue you have a Brian Ferry edition you know all these like wild cards you know, where where they where they kind of like lean into their heritage and come up with these very loud editions whilst I applaud them it's just about how they're positioned as well and the frequency of that um i think t- to their credit one of the reasons behind that might be that every other major watch company uh, and brand has come out with reissues i think seiko have been some of the last seiko have been the last to actually jump on that bandwagon and now that they are it's almost as if they hit like just a spike 
and hopefully this year and the years following that they'll start to kind of like you know taper that out and pace out the additions and start to have them segmented properly that was my only that was my only kind of negative of what they've done i was super happy to see kind of like reissues of 6105s hopefully we'll see a 66309 come out who knows maybe a 6139 uh chronograph might come out as well so more power to them uh, let's just hope they kind of like pace it accordingly and get their brand positioning right and make the most i think the worst thing when something does a reissue um a brand that suffered from that a little bit was certina they made one of the most fantastic issues ever of a dive watch the ds a pearly position and people forgot about it people didn't know didn't know about it so let's hope Seiko don't fall into that same kind of hole and when they do do these reissues they pace it out and they have it well well structured and not non, non fragmented but overall i'm very happy to see any re-edition from Seiko. Yeah. what did you make of the 55th anniversary editions Look, I think I think it's not. I, I'm not going to talk about the piece, right? Um, the piece itself, as much as about what what goes around reissues, um, and and this maybe takes me a little bit back to the fact that people don't know enough Seiko heritage for them to understand. And I think also here we have to talk about the ecosystem of Seiko, right? The retail experience, how the drop of that reissue is happening internationally and locally. So obviously, if you're a hardcore Seiko collector you'd understand it immediately, right? But if you go to a store, you know, um, again, if it's a bigger, you know, limited edition or, or it's just a limited edition, I think what needs to happen is that before these iconic limited editions, Seiko needs to work a little bit on, you know, the, the, the heritage and everything else. Um, for me, the details of the piece aren't, you know, I, I don't want to spend time on that because that really... It could have, it, it, you know, it could have been something else and it's still, it's still fine. It's, it's pretty close to what it is and everything else. Yeah, compared to the, the previous reissue with the, you know, unsigned Grand Seiko movement, I, I'd understand. But um, I think it's around how Seiko goes forward with reissues and limited editions. Because the issue is not just what Seiko is doing, but what everybody else is doing. And there is, you know, there is a drop happening almost weekly, if not monthly now, when it comes to reissues and limited editions and small drops, right? Um, and I think this is where things get lost. Even somebody like me who follows Seiko, sometimes I don't understand the relevance of a specific drop or a limited edition or a reissue. 62 Mass is a very iconic, very, very iconic uh, uh, dive watch, right? Um, uh, and I don't think that the reissue gave 62 Mass what it needed to give it. You know, um, and I don't want to compare to other brands, but you know, I think if we speak in general, one of for me, this one of the successful reissues, even though it didn't look like the original watch was the Black Bay, the two door Black Bay, right? But there was so much effort building the heritage of what this reissue was doing, even though it didn't look very, very similar to the initial, uh, you know, two door Submariners with the snowflake and everything else. In fact, the only thing that looks similar is the snowflake. Uh, hands right here now we're not talking about the grand seiko snowflakes we're talking about the the, the hands right and and, and the, the markers so i think this is maybe where seiko could spend a little bit more uh, time investing in bringing out the icon and creating awareness about why this is an icon before dropping that reissue right and that's if i want to market it to non-seiko hardcore people right because again stefan knows Ozzy knows, but somebody like me who's midway there might not make that connection right away. Um, and I know, this, I mean, this is this is something that Ozzy would be interested in. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Ozzy grew up around an RAF airbase in Ireland, and uh, for him, military issue watches have been. I mean, they, they've been very close to his heart. So and. Yeah especially Seiko military issued watches. So I, I want to ask you guys, what are your favorite stories around collecting Seiko? Do you want to go, do you want to go first, Ozzy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, there's, there's a couple of good uh, myth-busting ones. So just on the military thing, uh, so you have the, the, two, the two biggest myths are the Seiko Vulcan, yellow-faced, uh, was a 7, uh, oops, it was a, yeah, 7A28, very similar to the Gen 1 that Stefan has. But also there was the Seiko Contra, uh, both of them turned out to be completely false, but the idea is uh, ne never let the truth get in the way of a good story. I've had a Seiko Vulcan, or supposedly the Vulcan, 
And my, 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 it was one of my favorite techniques because it was like the grail, you know, of, of all military watches. Uh, there was the famous RAF Vulcan bomber. And the story was it was very dark inside. It was a, a four or five man crew. And the, the, uh, the, 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 the postmaster at the time well, said, okay, we'll do a special order specifically just for the crew, yellow dials so you can see at the nighttime. Uh, Eddie Platts runs a very definitive form in the UK uh, TZ UK form, uh, Eddie Platts from Time Factors. And uh, he actually chimed on and said, this is complete, utterly fabricated. I've spoken to somebody from one of the bases where he would have supplied, supply officer, that we would never do um, a one-off one buy of 700 watches for officers. And even on the very last year that the, uh, that the Vulcan actually flew, which is 1984. And uh, so it kind of pulled the myth apart. But for me, finding a Vulcan was... Uh, was a huge big thing and that, that was kind of one of things running other things about seiko and um seiko gen one the, the seven a two eight gen one uh listen if it's good enough for an raf fast jet pilots it's good enough for me but it was also they done a lot of time in afghanistan uh, chinook pilots would have worn them on the gen two as well and again the reason they were there is not because they're gorgeous watches uh this is this is very similar uh again it's a, it's a three uh kind of like a a three um, movement piece, all quartz. Yeah, to it's, it's a 72 as well. But again, they were reliable. Uh, you could swap them out. They were part of the uniform. They went. Up, they were on a NATO, so they're gorgeous. So for me, the the military the military version uh, of of Seikos were great. And of course, that brings us to the Willard, uh, one of the finest movies ever produced, Apocalypse Now. Uh, I'm 1977, so again, it's an iconic movie for someone of my age. Uh, you know, all that stuff. Yes, Marlon Brando had his, uh, you know, his bezel-free Rolex on at the time, the GMT, but everybody knows the star watch of that thing was 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 the 6105. And the great thing about the 6105, that, that would have been bought maybe in uh, on R&R &R at some of the army stores in Vietnam and stuff. So like the whole military connection for Seiko is, uh, is amazing. I'm not sure if the Seiko did uh, some of the Gen 1s would have made it to Falklands. Chances are they would have. I think it might have been Prezita's six BBs back then. Um, I'll need to look into that more. But chances are you could have had a Gen One flying I've heard, Falklands. I've well. heard that. I, I've heard that there were some actually. Yeah, maybe on, maybe on the Chinook pilots would have had them, not the fast jets. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe that's the thing. Yeah, we should we should definitely look into that more. So yeah, Seiko and military hand in hand. I, I actually had contacted uh, the Seiko PR team in Japan about the the Vulcan. Oh yeah. And uh, and they said no, we don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I guess so, some of these forum rumors. It's it started <laughs> off the forum. Exactly. There seems to be a lot of amazing things that Seiko doesn't want to talk about. If that's a marketing, if that's a marketing move, then I'd I'd like it because that means that they're willing to do something about these stories later. Mm. Um, and hopefully that's the case because there's there's a few things you know and a few stories that we still you know it's just they're myth right are they real are they not did this happen did this not so i think that's a pretty interesting uh, element of the brand as well yeah but like ozzy says never let the truth get in the way of a good story uh, yeah, stefan you right. you have a uh, an interesting uh, military issue seiko don't you I, I do actually, as he was talking about it, uh, I was lucky enough, uh, last time I was in Tokyo before uh, this whole craziness happened, I was able to pick one. Uh, this is, a, as Ozzy was saying, this is a Beautiful. Gen 1 RAF. Um, yeah. it's, uh, it's in very good condition, even though, uh, you know, it was issued to military. And of course, uh, it, it does have the, uh, the marking on the back, which is obviously, uh, you know, what, what you need to look out for these military watches, right? That's how it's issued to the broad arrow. Uh, uh, so I, I love this watch. I've got a few of the uh, 7828s, and uh, oh, these beautiful. ones have a, a great history, right? So one of them, uh, well, 7838 was in a, in a Bond movie as well. Um, there's, there's a Vulcan uh, story, and uh, off the back of the Vulcan story, there's another story that I found quite interesting, and it's also probably very fa fabricated. This is not a Vulcan, but it's it's similar. similar. This is a, a seven eight thirty eight uh, uh -huh. yellow dial. Now I've looked for the the history behind this one uh, everywhere. I can't find yeah. anything, but I've, I found a story that I like to believe. Uh, again, 
even if it's not true, also quite uh, quite gory uh, in a way. It's supposedly the yellow dial, or the color yellow is the is the last color that you can see if you're under the effect of radiation. So um, a lot of these supposedly were made for um, workers of uh, of nuclear factories, um, so they could always be able to continue timing. Now, whether or not this is true, I haven't been able, to, no way to corroborate that. It's a cool story, nonetheless. And this is this is something that uh, I find really interesting about uh, Seiko, and I'm going to tie that in with the with the nicknames. I think Seiko is the only brand in the world that the nicknames are actually not given by the company themselves. Yeah, the nicknames are given by the fans. And then Seiko themselves actually go like, that's a cool nickname and we're gonna make signs for it. And you go to the stores and you will see the samurai, you will see the sumo, you will see the monster. And they didn't give them those nicknames. I love that. Now, why can't we also make our own stories for the watches, right? <laughs> it <laughs> seems point, to be the case. <laughs> it's true. And just, just on that note, Stefan, I was just checking, uh... It's quite a good military watch book if people have it. And then if, we, if you flick, uh, it covers off the Gen 1, Gen 2. But it does mention about the Vulcan in there. And uh, but who, who knows? People love to shoot down these stories. I don't. I love to. I love that story about radiation. A bit difficult to bring to market, though. But uh, <laughs> all, all the same no, no, but it, does, it doesn't get cooler than that, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And it makes you wonder if. if uh... You know, as a brand, should you sort of pay credence to these rumors? Do you set up a forum, sort of an authorized forum, where you can sort of clear the air, or just just remain ambiguous about? Yeah, it, it's, it sort it, of it, propels it, the myth it, as well. It does, it does, because the idea is, as Stefan said, you as a brand obviously can't instigate it. Uh, you can support it and you know uh, nurture it. But to make it authentic, uh, there's been many brands that have been caught out badly. A very famous Italian brand I used to collect was caught out extremely badly by kind of like false heritage rumors about what it did and what it was going to do. And it was just, a, it, it really, really, really destroyed the brand overnight. So I think if, uh, I think Seiko, because they're so conservative, probably would never do something like that. But again, if they released a, uh, a reissued 728 with a yellow dial that looked like a Seiko Vulcan, I would probably be Definitely adding one to my collection, just based on the uh, on the myth around it and the kind of that kind of interest piece alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Moving I think, on. I think, uh, I think, I think just on, on that quick note, we shouldn't forget that look, Seiko at the end of the day is a mass production company, right? With thousands and thousands of references, and I don't think that they were even themselves capable of having archives of everything they've done. I am sure there are certain issues that just happened right um in terms of production number per references or whatever there's things in the 80s and the 90s that just happened that you know weren't that important were you know didn't generate this much revenue there's no archive so and, and the more you have that in a mass production company the more there are going to be certain references that are unearthed where you don't know the real story behind them um obviously there might be a little bit more documentation on military watches because they're military issue watches so you might know you know which armies or navies or whoever used them but other than that there are certain references that just very that are still very obscure and and that adds to the coolness factor of of, of the brand right. right moving on uh you know the the fly in the ointment for a lot of uh, seiko enthusiasts has been the price points of seiko watches in in, in recent years you know it's you can't really get a a, a 200 meter water resistant diver anymore for, for under a thousand dirhams like you used to. You know, uh, price points have gone up. What have you guys made of this? Uh, Ozzy, do you want to go first? I, um, it's, it's, I'll be contentious. It's an absolutely good thing. Um, obviously, because I think uh, both Faisal and Stefan had mentioned about the buying, ex the buying experience. Um, traditionally buying a Seiko, you would have bought it in a multi-brand, um, like a multi-brand non or semi-luxury environment. So the idea of the prices are going up though, it makes the watch slightly more, how would you say, uh, it's not obtainable, but it makes it slightly more aspirational. So we've mentioned about a non-branded GS movement and, uh, and, and you know, a 200 meter diver, that is super cool. 
And if they were to do that again, uh, again, that's an aspirational watch. Stefan's beautiful tuna, for example, 1981. If you bring out a ratio of that, probably around the two, three thousand dollar mark. What I think it does, it opens up a whole new sector of buyers who, who are appreciative of watches, but also um, uh, might be more appreciative of the brand as well. I think it's a great thing for the brands. It makes it more of an aspirational brand, gives more interest into kind of the, some of its heritage as well. And uh, I, really, I really hope it works. So there's not there's another good point to make in this as well. A lot of the a lot of the Uber luxury brands that we uh, adore and love were completely unavailable in 2018, 2019, and obviously in 2020 as well. So people have now been looking to say, look, I've worked hard. I want to get something to reward myself for this work. I want something that's an interest watch, a tool watch that will suit my active lifestyle. Maybe 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 Seiko can be in there. You know, it's 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 that type of brand that that could fit, fill that space. So overall, I, I I think I think it's a good thing. Conversely. If they start to make them cheaper and lower the quality of the watch, like you had a 38 mil SKX and had that lovely little rattle from the bezel and the bracelet, that's nice. It's a nuance, but it's not something I want to, uh, you know, see more of. And, and if I'm going into like a two, three thousand dollar watch, uh, so yeah, I I, I I I think it's a good thing. I think it makes makes it much more of a, a, a watch watch to strive for and to be aspirational. All right, Stefan, what what do you make of it? Yeah, I think uh, Aussie raises uh, very good points uh, already. So uh, some of them I'm going to obviously repeat and I'll just uh, talk a little bit around them. Uh, but uh, first of all, just to, to reiterate what he said, it's good that they're moving up and not down. Um, that, you know, there's, there's a lot of the, um, of the charm as well as of the uh, older references. You know, the, the whole story about if you, when you open a, a new Seiko, an SKX or Tuna or uh, Turtle, uh, not so much with the Tunas, but with the Turtles, yes, you, you need to look out for the misaligned bezels, right? And the, uh, and the misaligned chapter rings. That was the thing. And, you know, it, even when you, when you see the, the forums, uh, forum posts for sale watches, it's kind of a thing. It's like, oh, by the way, this one doesn't have a misaligned bezel. So that's why I'm charging a little bit more for it. So we want to see less of that. And there's a, there's a charm to it, right? Of course, you know, as Faisal was mentioning before, mass produced watches, right? So it's good that they're moving towards the direction of actually spending more, making more effort into, into putting a watch that is worth what it's, uh, what it's supposed to be, to be honest. I think the price point is where it's supposed to be, uh, to, to echo also what Ozzy was saying. Um, some of the watches in the past, uh, this is a Marine Master 300 uh, uh, SBDX. Um, so the 001 and the 017, uh, very similar watches. These watches were sold for much lower than they should have been selling. These are absolute monster watches. These are uh, monocoque cases, 300 meter uh, water resistance. There's no misaligned bezels in these ones. You know, Dia Shield uh, coating on a lot of these. So to be honest, Seiko should have been charging more for watches like this. Um, so whether or not you can you can now pick up an SKX for what you uh, were supposed to, well, the prices uh, increase as inflation increases as well. We have to account for that. And we don't have the SKX anymore, long live the king, uh, but we have the turtles. And the turtles are not too much higher in terms of a price. Uh, uh, so I would say that the turtle is really the... Um, you know the the watch is actually following in the footsteps of the SKX and not so much as the as the five KX as the as is being called now. Uh, that is a different brand altogether, a different uh, model altogether, I would say. So yeah, just to reiterate that one point I want to make though is when you start charging more and if the brand is moving further into just charging above, you know, in terms of thousands of dollars, you know, two thousand and above or thousand five hundred dollars and above for most of the watches. I think the brand experience needs to improve a little bit more. Now, what's interesting with Seiko is that you can get close to the brand uh, through the ADs as well, and uh, you can build a relationship quite easily, something that is not very easy with all the other watch brands. But the actual experience when you're in the store, the watches that you see next to it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and many of the ADs, that has become a problem with a lot of the, the ones that were snobbish uh, of uh, buying a Seiko mm -hmm. at the older prices would say, well, why should I spend this much money on a watch that's sitting next to uh, X and uh, Y brand, right? So I think Seiko can charge more. The quality is there. The heritage is there. Let's let's up the ante a little bit on the uh, boutique experience. I would say that's that's the only thing. 
I think that's some very valid points if, if Seiko is listening. What do you make of it, Fezzer? Yeah, look, I think the issue is, is, is around not just pricing alone. Um, it's around pricing when it comes to increasing prices of references, you know, and you bought in the past, right? So let's say I bought my Samurai, for example, I don't remember the price, let's say for 2K. I'm going to buy a new one because they have a new limited edition or a dial iteration or, you know, a different execution. And the new, you know, the, the, the new uh, 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 pricing on it is all of a sudden 3K, right? And I think this is where the issue is happening. It's when you're increasing pricing on, on references that people know. The point that Stefan made is very, very important. They had certain references that in hindsight were cheaper than they were supposed or less than they were supposed to be positioned. So now when you're increasing the prices on those, this is when the problem is happening. The other thing I think that Seiko needs to focus a little bit more on outside of pricing is their lines and how you're blurring, you know, how you're mixing the different lines together. Where does, you know, the five series start and end, where does prospect start and end, uh, where does presage start and end? Because right now you have a lot of overlay between all these different lines. And I'm not gonna you know, speak about brand Seiko because you know that's, that's, that's a different discussion. But with this, within the Seiko brand, where are these starting and ending? And what do each one of those really stand for? This is where the issue is happening. If I'm going to buy a Seiko diver today for four or five K, right? Um, Whereas I knew I could buy an SKX historically for, you know, 900 dirhams. This is where the questioning is going to start. It will take time. They can definitely sell at that price point because the quality of the watch is there, right? Especially, you know, you know when, when, when you look at, at prospects, when you look at the professional series and everything else, there's definitely quality over there. But it's about how you're blurring the line between all these different things. Um, and I think this is really where, 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 where focus needs to come in. So it's it's not standalone pricing. It's the benchmark that people knew the you know knew that this is what Seiko sells for, and all of a sudden I'm paying 30, 40 percent more. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, just just to add on, on to what Faisal was saying there, it's um, when you when you're in New York, did you get a chance to see the the Seiko standalone store? Did you get a chance to see that? No, no, I, I don't think it was open when we were there. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's the thing. It's like uh, when I was in the UK, I went to a Bremont store and Bremont traditionally is a standalone, right? Mayfair and stuff like that. And I know Seiko UK are trying to roll out similar concepts. And I think all three of us, all four of us, if we went to a Seiko standalone store, we'd be like kids in a candy store. We'd be like, wow, everything is well represented and focused. You'll have your Grand Seiko arena, you know, you'll have the presage. But I, I think that would really amplify the brand. It's tricky to do. Obviously, we know... Uh, mall space and stuff like that and mall operations is an expensive business but there's no reason that uh, I, I couldn't see Seiko moving into that sort of model of having a Seiko standalone store getting it out as Stefan rightly said getting it out and it's in its own regard away from kind of like not lesser brands but brands that are offered the same yeah it's actually there's a um, they Seiko opened the prospects Seiko prospects specific store in Ginza uh, right before I returned from uh, Japan and uh, as you said, I was there on a weekly basis. I know the watches that are there, but I was yeah. there anyway, because I wanted yeah. to play with the new LX. Or, and what's really cool is that they had a section where they had you know, the, the, the 62 Mass, the 6105. They had all these yeah. watches, the historical references, and you could see them. So you can compare mm. the watch, the reissue. So yeah, so just to make an extra point there. Yeah, yeah. Right. Now, uh... In your opinion, the top three collectible Seikos. Faisal, do you want to go first? Yeah, look, uh, so for me, it's definitely the uh, uh, 6138 or 6139. Um, so a Bogue would do or a Panda would do. Um, you know, those historical chronographs, I think these are definitely collectible. We're talking here from a heritage perspective, right? Vintage collectible watches. Um, 62 mass, obviously, if one can find one, uh, you know, that's going to be, uh, you know, definitely uh, collectible. And I would say a King Seiko, right? Because a King Seiko high beat is really a disruptive watch. I know that the focus of our call today was maybe more on the tool watch side of things, the divers, the military, so on and so forth. But there's also a lot of heritage with, you know, with simple time only watches. Um, 
you know, Seiko at the end of the day got the Swiss industry on its knees with its courts, right? So I think we have to look at courts. We have to look at high beat. If Grand Seiko comes in, then, you know, Spring Drive and the beauty of Spring Drive and what it stands for. So I'd say these these would be, you know, real collectibles for me that I'd consider. Um, and, you know, Ozzy and, and, and Stefano, I'm on, I'm, I'm on the lookout for a military issue watch, uh, okay. Seiko to, to add to my collection. So... Uh, let it know let it be known to the world but i would <laughs> yeah. say these 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 would be the ones but I, I you know these from a vintage perspective i would say for anybody especially now that the skx is discontinued that's definitely it's not collectible in terms of rarity obviously i mean you're talking about millions of watches produced but you need to have an skx in your collection in my opinion well said. Um, so that's yeah. yeah that's that's about it for me ozzy do you want to go next yeah, man, yeah. So I think for me, uh, first and foremost, it has to be a Seiko 615, a Captain Willard. Uh, for me, it's the iconic kind of like, uh, you know, uh, barrel, barrel cased uh, kind of diver. But I, I think it has to be, uh, the great thing about the, about the Willard is that every single one ever made had huge issues with the crown. Obviously, Seiko's fixed that with this one. So it needs to have a little bit of water damage to give it a little bit of character as well. Um, I think a contentious one here, Everyone should try and get a Vulcan once in their life, purely for the hype around it. You know, yeah, purely for the hype around it. And because uh, uh, who knows if that, that story is, 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 yeah, exactly true or not. But uh, they're hard to find as well. There's not that many of them around. Stuff I like he said, find me a yellow dial seven A two eight. And then finally, I'm a huge, huge fan of the uh, of the Marine Master Professional 300 meter. The tuna. So that's the SBB N031. That's the gold in the case tuna. It's just such a mega cool watch. Such a mega cool, cool watch. Slash, maybe a Seiko Arnie as well. Though. Um, one thing I wanted to mention as well, that's three watches. Um, I think everyone should get a Z119 bracelet. So Seiko produced that as a solid link jubilee long before Rolex were even doing it. I know um, Uncle Seiko, or is this... Uncle Seiko tried to produce something uh, similar to it, like a, a replica. It wasn't halfway as good. And if you can find, if you can find a Z one one Z one nine nine bracelet, I saw a link. You're absolutely laughing. And those are three watches of one bracelet to collect. Faisal's probably gone. <laughs> you, you, you want to collect no, no, a single I'm, I'm, bracelet? It's, it's the thing you, you actually, like the least about I'm, them. <laughs> I'm actually taking notes. I actually noted <laughs> down the last bit number, so. I'll, 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 we'll, we'll ping them into our group afterwards or, or we can share them in the comments below. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Stefan? So, uh, Your top three. Yeah, I'll start, I'll start by saying that uh, I'm lucky enough to have gotten the Z199 uh, bracelet uh, oh, as I'm part sure. of, a, of a, a 7549 purchase that I bought. Wow. Right, so it just came with the bracelet. And when I saw it, I'm like, hey, "Hold on a second, is this an Uncle Seiko one?" And it's not. Yeah. Uh, so I was wow. so yeah. so happy about this. Obviously, the seller did not know uh, that the bracelet, in its own right, cost probably more than the watch itself. Um, yeah. So happy about that. Uh, that's tucked away at the moment. Um, okay, so top three um, Seikos to um, to collect. I would say the 62 Mass. This is number one for me. Um, first ever mechanical diver for Seiko, right? And uh, Seiko has a lot of firsts. So um, I'm going to try to to keep it within the first in my top three. I don't have a 62 mass. Um, I was this close of purchasing one and I didn't. I regret it till this day with the, with the big crown instead of the small crown. There's variations. Uh, but I've got the SLA 017 to... Um, Oh, to keep me happy in the meantime that that is a beautiful reissue and i'm very glad that i i jumped on that um the second one i would say is any 7a 29 uh, 28 um just to go back to what Tosma was saying uh regarding the the vulcan if you can get a vulcan wow congratulations to you because that's mm -hmm. that's impossible right but if you can get for example uh, um you know uh, raf one uh, gen one that's that's a fantastic collectible for me. But if you can't get a um, an RAF one, uh, just get any of the other ones, right? So um, this white one is a, is an absolute beauty. Uh, if you can get the Japanese domestic market edition, this comes with a particular um, you know prize with it, which is the clasp itself. You can, if you get the correct uh, clasp, it actually says Speedmaster because in the Japanese domestic market, this watch was actually uh, sold as a Speedmaster. So, you know, you can post this also on Speedy Tuesday um, <laughs> on Instagram and, uh, and piss up a couple uh, of people in the process. 
<laughs> I love it. So that would be my my second one. And uh, my third one, I have to say, it would be the Seiko Poke, if you can get a hands on. I don't have one. I cannot show it to the camera now. But oh, a Seiko yeah. Poke, the, the re, the, that's going to be um, a bit of a project to get because there's so many fakes out there. There's the Aussie Poke. There's a Silver Poke. There's a, you know, but the real yeah. Poke with the, the right gold dial, that's an absolute smash yeah, collectible. Specifically so, on the boat, so, so many Frankensteins. I mean, so it's unbelievable. Frank yeah, and there's a guy now in Poland who's doing the uh, the, the Ratsu finishing or reconditioning a lot of the uh, of the six one three nine cases yeah. as well. Even a six one three nine six zero zero two. This what well, this is plentiful and you know so much so much fun to be had in these as well. I've got three of my watches with that guy Aussie right now. Oh, the, uh, the lapinist. It took lapinist, yeah. Lapinist. It took two and a half months to clear uh, customs. My God, so, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and are you looking forward to seeing the end result? Yeah, so much. Yeah, yeah. be careful. You might cut yourself on that sharp finish, though. <laughs> yeah. Before we go any further, I just want to bring in what Sadat said. Uh, so that's on, on the chat. Uh, when it, he was, he basically adds to what Stefan said about the brand experience. He says a Swatch can have a standalone store. Se Seiko can, you know, and they have the range, unlike so many other brands, to actually put forward a very solid brand experience. I, I think it's, it's absolutely right. He's, he's got it spot on. I think, I think Seiko could do well with a, with a standalone uh, brand store. I, I, I'm just surprised when, when it came to the top three collectibles. Uh, I think for me, uh, I love the fact that Seiko took its time to build the grandfather tuner. So the 6159-7010 uh, for me is is I mean, I, I, just I just love what Seiko did with that. You know, they had complaints. They said, you know what, okay, so we, 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 we'll build a proper, you want a professional diver's watch, we'll build it for you. They took their time, 1975. I mean, they, I, there's, there's nothing like it. So for me, I think the, the, the grandfather tuner is, is, is extremely collectible. I, I had the good fortune of meeting uh, the gentleman who, who, who designed it, who, the engineer who worked on it. And uh, wow, I mean, wow. you, should see his, you, should, you should see his watch. It's it's uh, it's it's taken quite a beating, but uh, it it still works. Um, yeah. Uh, so going forward, what do you guys hope to see from Seiko? This is a big year for Seiko. It's, they're celebrating a big anniversary this year. What what do you guys hope to see from Seiko? More from Seiko this year. Yeah. Look, I mean, it's this is a very hard question to answer to be honest from Seiko specifically because for, for me Seiko represents really the best of all worlds you know and in, in, in the sense that when they do fun cheap for the lack of a better word or affordable attainable horology they do it perfectly well when they do mid-tier they do it perfectly well when they go into high horology they do it well in my opinion what I'd like to see from Seiko again is is a more structured approach in its lines uh, more um, content on heritage so that when we issues and drops come in, we understand what they are or the layman understands what they are. Again, I'm not going to put myself at the level of Stef uh, Stefan and Ozzy, right? I'm more of somebody who's really still learning about the brand. So my perspective might be a little bit different. So I want this content. I want more of this content. I want a more structured approach to the lines. I want to be able to understand what Seiko 5 is versus the prospect versus Alex versus you know, all these different things. Uh, uh, from a watchmaking perspective, I think, look, last year was a great year. There were a lot of great, uh, you know, pieces that, that were drops, that were dropped. You go today, there is a great selection of pieces. Um, I don't know how much of the, um, the, the selection available today in the UAE market, rep is, you know, represents versus the true selection of, of, of Seiko. And that's why you always hear in any Seiko, you know, discussion JDM or out, you know, or US or so on and so forth, right? Because there's all these things that might be available overseas that we can get locally. So I'd like to see a little bit more of that if possible. Uh, but that's, you know, that's about it. I'm not going to be very demanding as long as, I, as they help me understand the brand and all of these different elements of the brand. Right. Thanks, Faisal. Uh, Stefan? I, I would agree with uh, Faisal, first of all, with that. Um, just one comment on that. Uh, I think that when we start, we, when a brand like Seiko, one of the things that I really like about Seiko as a collector 
is being able to, to find these rare references. And if they get too structured, we're going to stop seeing them. Uh, an example here, I've got this uh, Bumblebee uh, SKX yellow dial, right? This was only made for the, the for the US market. Uh, if they had very clean lines, et cetera, they would have it pretty much everywhere. Uh, and I wouldn't have this particularly special piece, even though it's a you know a relatively affordable piece. Singapore dial or Malaysia dial, that's another kind of a rare thing that you have to look for. So if, if you start making things a little bit too structured, uh, you might actually lose some of that um, interest that the brand has as a collector, in my personal opinion. One thing that I would like to see more from Seiko is uh, is, is their approach in social media. It's a bit of a change in the approach to social media. As we know now, it's, it's not so much, not only because of COVID, but it's it's uh, the brand experience happens a lot on social media channels and Instagram and, and others, right? Uh, I only use Instagram, so uh, for me, Facebook and all this is not so relevant, but uh, to be able to to have one unified view of how to reach the brand, there's so many um, uh, official Seiko um, Seiko uh, uh, accounts, and they post completely different things. So you don't know what is the new products today, etc. Now, the three of us here are aware, and probably the the rest of the people here are aware of what's out uh, from Seiko this year, right? But the majority of people that are trying to ramp up and come into the brand, they'll go into one of the Seiko accounts and they'll see. Uh, okay, well, they released a bunch of uh, ladies' watches with uh, with diamonds this year. All right, cool. But they don't see, for example, the reissue of Cuff and Willard, depending which Seiko, uh, Seiko account you get into. So getting a more unified view on the social media would be uh, important. And also, you know, involve the collectors. You have a Seiko. They have the most amazing, uh, you know, collectors uh, and fans in the industry. I would mm -hmm. say that very happily, right? So yeah. reach out to them, use them. Yeah. Ozzy? 100% agree with uh, Stefan. That's probably the mo most engaged community there is in any, in, any watch, in any watch community. For me, the one thing I want, because I see we're running out of time, is a 40 millimeter GMT Grand Seiko. Uh, 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 Navy, Navy bezel. That's all I want to see from Seiko this year. Uh, I want to move into that sphere of uh, the current one they have. Is, was it 43 points, 43.2? Uh, I want to see kind of like the, uh, the sweet spot, the 39 mils, the 38 mils in particular, maybe a, a 38 mils 6139 re-edition. But if Grand Seiko were to bring out a 39 or 40 mil GMT, take my money. It's as simple as that. All right, I think no, that's I, all. I think all the, all the, you need to pull some muscle and do a piece unique. That's something, you know, that uh, Grand Seiko can start doing it to, repli to, to replicate the big boys. I mean, it's Aussie, you know. He should be able to get a piece unique. <laughs> sure, man. Thank you, Faisal, for your support. Uh, <laughs> yeah. we, could, we could go on with this, but I think we'd have to uh, bring this to an end. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Uh, Stefan, Aussie, Faisal. Uh, thank you so much, most kind to give us that, your, your time and I hope the participants have learned something. Uh, I wish we had more time to uh, sort of take questions, but we will post uh, an edited version of this on, on, on our YouTube and Instagram channels. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today and hopefully we'll do more of these. Thank, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.